system completely collapsed. I think it was probably because of that droning on academic uh, presentation I made yesterday. But today, uh, it's, it, it dropped offline, and then sadly for you, it came back up. So here I am again today. Our session today is going to be hopefully a lot uh, lighter than the one yesterday. Uh, yesterday's uh, was very academic, uh, had to do a lot with history and uh, legal systems for the past 3,000 or so years, bringing us up to our Constitution. And today I'm going to talk about the FBI, and I'm going to talk about the Department of Justice, and I'm going to talk about how cases are actually worked uh, in the FBI. I was an FBI agent for 26 years, uh, prosecuted, uh, assisted in the prosecution of hundreds of cases. During my 26 years, I'm pleased to say I lost one trial. One trial, uh, it was in uh, New Jersey, and the assistant United States attorney that was trying the case was rather inexperienced. And yesterday, you might recall me mentioning the name of a United States District Court judge named Frederick Lacey, who was a really tough guy. And uh, this young uh, assistant United States attorney was not quite ready yet, and Judge Lacey ate his lunch, and we lost the trial. But that's the only case that I lost. And most of my cases, like most other FBI agents, are, their cases, probably 80% of them plead. They never go into a trial environment. In the latter part of my uh, career, in probably the last eight years or so of my career, I had a lot of trials and very complex in a very complex area called environmental crime. But that'll be down at the end of what I have to say today. Everybody wants to know, what does it take to be an FBI agent? How do you have to get in? What do you have to do to get in? Well, you have to have a degree. It can be in any kind of discipline you want. Uh, the FBI hires nobody right out of college. Uh, a law degree is helpful. An accounting degree is helpful. A language facility is helpful. But the FBI hires all kinds of disciplines. We hire scientists and engineers and just any, any kind of uh, person that uh, has good experience. And it's just the qualifications are based on the individual and if that individual has the characteristics that we're looking for. Um, I was an Army officer. I was a captain in military intelligence running a counterintelligence field office at Fort Campbell, Kentucky. And I dealt every day with uh, agents from the FBI. I got to know these guys pretty well, and after a couple of months, they started putting the rush on me to leave the military, uh, which was going to be my career, and come with the FBI because they thought they had a better deal. After a considerable amount of consideration, I decided to do that, and on uh, June 10th, 1968, I joined with the FBI. Uh, I think we need to understand who the FBI is and who the Department of Justice is and how each operates. So the first thing I want to do is talk a little bit about the Department of Justice. The Department of Justice, the United States Department of Justice, operates under the executive branch of the federal government. They work directly. The Attorney General, William Barr, works directly for the President of the United States. Um, the United States, uh, the Department of Justice prosecutes violations of the Constitution and the United States Code, uh, which we're going to talk about later, the United States Code. They're headquartered in Washington, D.C. Uh, United States Attorney's offices are located in every state, and they're usually co-located with a United States District Court. North Carolina has three judicial districts, the Western, Middle, and Eastern District. We are in the Middle District, and there are uh, federal courts in Winston-Salem and in Greensboro. Uh, the United States attorneys are part of the Department of Justice and they have assistant United States attorneys and they prosecute most of the violations of federal law, usually violations of Title 18 United States Code, which is the primary section of the United States Code that deals with criminal offenses. There are 53 different uh, codes in the United States Code uh, but I mean 53 different titles, excuse me, but Title 18 has most other criminal offenses. Sometimes the Department of Justice, or DOJ as we'll call it, will prosecute selected cases in district courts throughout the country. These are usually cases like maybe tax fraud or other complex cases that uh, need a specialty. In my case, 
toward the end of my career, I worked uh, with the environmental crime section of the Department of Justice, prosecuting environmental criminal cases. The FBI is the primary investigative agency of the United States Department of Justice. It's quartered in, headquartered in Washington, D.C., and the SOG is for seat of government, which is what they used to call it when I was a young agent. The FBI has field offices or resident agencies located in every state. It's staffed by special agents and support personnel. Special agents are sworn federal law enforcement officers, and most of the support staff are not. Uh, agents are trained at the FBI Academy at Quantico, Virginia. When I went through, uh, the training lasted about four months. So, at the time I came into the Bureau, uh, J. Edgar Hoover was the director. Uh, he had been the director uh, for about 150 years when I came in. I'm just kidding you. He was appointed in the early 30s as a director of the FBI and actually is the father of modern law enforcement. Now, a lot of people like to make jokes about Hoover, but Hoover was quite a fellow. He uh, was very bright. Uh, he invented uh, or put together the uh, fingerprint system, uh, national record keeping, uh, hiring only professional people to, to uh, and well-educated people to be uh, special agents of the FBI, uh, put together the uh, criminal, uh, the crime labs, the forensic lab that is the finest in the world, and he was quite a fellow. Uh, he probably stayed much too long at the uh, helm of the FBI because he, he actually, toward the end, held the FBI from developing the way it should have. He died in 1972 after I had been in the FBI for about four years. This is a photograph of uh, FBI headquarters in downtown Washington on Pennsylvania Avenue. Uh, it's about used up, now that's when the building was just being uh, constructed. Uh, it's about served its useful purpose and there's a lot of uh, conversation now about moving it from downtown Washington to somewhere else. Quantico has um, taken some of the uh, uh, laboratory and some other elements down there, so uh, wouldn't be surprised if they move FBI headquarters. That's my FBI training class. NAC-12 started June 10th, 1968. You'll notice on the front row there are two guys with light-colored suits, and to the right of the man in the middle is yours truly. Uh, holy Michael. I think we've got an alarm going off. What are we going to do, Brian? We're going to keep going? Okay. We don't care about the alarm. We're going to keep going. If, it's, if the smoke gets so that you can't see me through the smoke, just let me know and we'll work something out. But for right now, we're going to keep going, and hopefully this will stop. Uh, FBI uh, agent training is uh, quite interesting. It's uh, very rigorous, but the people that you meet there are some of the finest people uh, in the world. And I can still remember and still have a relationship with uh, several people in my training class. That's what the FBI Academy looked like when I went to the Academy. It was a three-story building, had a basement that had a, a gun vault and a uh, weapons cleaning room in it. That's what the Academy looks like today. Just a little bit of difference, as you might notice. And that's not even a complete photograph of it. There's a lot more buildings uh, since this photograph was made on the left and then back toward those ball fields. On the right-hand side, you can see a few of the FBI firearms ranges. That's what a class today looks like, uh, made up of uh, people from widely varied backgrounds, and they're just great folks. They're great, in my view, they're just great kids, because at my age of 79, they are kids to me. They're the age of some of my grandchildren. Marvelous people. That's our firearms range. Uh, the guy in the red hat there is a firearms instructor, and he's teaching a new agent's class. 
Uh, firearms is a very important thing about the FBI, and I'm going to talk about some things in a very direct way. Hopefully, upset you, me, Brian. Hopefully, I won't up, won't upset you, but I have to talk about some things that are rather uh, difficult topics. If you're going to be an FBI agent, you are going to have. It's just like going into the military. You have to be able to defend yourself, and you have to be able to defend those around you. And if you can't do that, you might want to consider changing careers. It was always my objective to go home every night. And uh, I obviously did because I am here. If someone uh, that I was dealing with during the day uh, decided they wanted to prevent me from going home, that was not a good idea. Because when I was doing this kind of very heavy work, uh, I was not somebody that you wanted to to trifle with. Anyway, uh, I, I uh, finished training school and I was assigned to my first office in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. I stayed there for about a year and then we were transferred to uh, Newark, New Jersey, the broken wine bottle capital of the world. Uh, we used to walk in the train and we would see how many different broken wine bottle uh, labels we could identify like Sneaky Pete and Red Dagger and Boone's Farm. There was a, just a whole variety. We became real experts in, uh, in wine bottles, discarded wine bottles. But anyway, in Newark, the reason I went to Newark was in the summer of 1968, and I talked about this a little bit yesterday, Congress passed the Omnibus Crime Bill and Safe Streets Act. And what that did was it gave the FBI the legal authority to conduct electronic surveillance. Uh, electronic surveillance back then was quite bulky. We didn't have the... Uh, very small, sophisticated devices that we had today. And uh, installing a uh, listening device of some kind, an electronic device, uh, was uh, very, very difficult. But that's what we did. And I worked organized crime up there for nine years in New York City and in uh, New Jersey. During that time, um, uh, I uh, installed or uh, wrote the affidavit for the second, third, and fourth legal wiretap ever installed in the United States. It was uh, in a gambling operation. The subject of the case was a uh, organized crime figure. He wasn't a button man, but he was a, a button man is a made, made guy. He wasn't a made guy, but uh, he was uh, up pretty good. And uh, he was running a gambling operation and we uh, set up a uh, Title III, as it's called, a, a listening device on his phone and uh, worked that case, and uh, the case came to fruition, and we indicted uh, the subject, Tony Sneedy. And uh, Tony never made it to trial, though. He died of uh, overweight, uh, two in the head and one of the chest. It was three ounces, I think, which had nothing to do with our case, but it was a girlfriend's uh, husband who didn't like what was going on that uh, took Mr. Sneedy out. But that was a very interesting time, and I worked a lot of uh, top-level uh, organized crime figures. Organized crime was very interesting in those days. I interviewed many, many of the, uh, the Dons, the, the Capos, the top people in organized crime. Attitude, better at your job than I am at mine, you'll catch me. If you're not, you won't. And that's the way it was. And we had several unwritten agreements. They didn't bother our families. We didn't bother their families. It was kind of a professional thing back and forth between us. But I also worked other assignments when I was there, like everybody else did. And this next uh, shot that you see here is uh, a newspaper of a uh, tragic bank robbery that we had. Um, you'll see uh, the, the headline is Edison Cop, Bandit Killed and Hold Up, and then a very poignant uh, headings, uh, I'm hit, get me a priest, don't let me die, my wife is pregnant. This points out to most folks that uh, being an FBI agent, uh, being a police officer, is very serious work. The uh, person that you see there with the dark black hair, the handsome guy on the left side of the car peering into the car is me. You can see that the window of the car is shot out. Uh, there was. Uh, bodies still in the car. Uh, the guy on the right-hand side is uh, standing over the body of the bank robber. Uh, the fellow standing to my left behind me 
uh, is a dear, dear friend named Claude Duncan, Claude Maisel Duncan, Jr. Claude was a, an accountant, brilliant, and he was also an, a fingerprint expert. So we went to the morgue later that afternoon after that robbery. We didn't know who the robber was, had, didn't have a clue. He didn't have any identification on him. And Claude spooned his prints. That means he rolled his prints with a, a spoon type uh, mechanism. We uh, didn't have any way to electronically transmit those prints in those days. That was probably 1972, somewhere around in there. And we uh, took the prints up to Newark International Airport gave them to an Eastern Airlines uh, pilot who was running a shuttle back and forth to Washington, and he flew them to Washington, and uh, that night uh, we found out who the robber was. But that was the old days and primitive methods. I did a lot of instruction. Uh, this is me teaching a, uh, what we called a defensive tactics class. It's a, a class that blends uh, judo and boxing and karate and all kinds of stuff. And you can see I've got the person in a pretty uh, strained position there, uh, but you need to know how to defend yourself. And I was pretty good at that. I was also pretty good with firearms. Uh, this is a photograph of myself on the left, and the man on the right is J. Wallace LaPrad, Wally LaPrad. Uh, I think he might be Gene LaPrad's long lost uncle. I called Gene Wally about half the time. But that is a called a, a possible. You can see up the top it says Newark possible. Uh, that was the first one that I shot. And uh, I became a firearms instructor later. And uh, Mr. LaPrade was also an excellent shot. And he and I and the other firearms instructors would have competitions during our firearms training. And I don't have any, I've probably shot 100 possibles after that. but. That was my, my first one. Because I was pretty good with that sort of thing, Mr. LaPrade and some other people, if there was something nasty going on, they usually called me out to come and help out with what was going on. And for that reason, and at about that time in 1972, I believe it was, the FBI uh, started uh, a SWAT training program, Special Weapons and Tactics Training Program. This was the second class that they ever had. And in the second row on the extreme left with a cap on there and the lighter fatigues kind of uniform is me. Uh, the, we had the New York office there. Uh, in front of myself, those guys kneeling with the camos on there are uh, uh, from San Francisco. Uh, the people to their right uh, were from uh, Los Angeles. The people behind me were from, from Philadelphia. And the people on the opposite side were from New York. The big tall guy in the center there is a fellow named Milt Graham. And as you can tell, he is a pretty good sized lad. And Milt was a defensive tackle uh, at one time for the Detroit Lions. We had uh, part of our training was called uh, Lions and Tigers. And they would put uh, a five man team on the mat. And you would sit down, and you would have headgear and a lightweight boxing gloves on and they would put another team on the mat, and the last guy on the mat was the winner. And needless to say, Uncle Milty back there uh, was uh, often the last person on the mat. Uh, the uh, lesson that I learned is on the second row in the extreme right-hand side, there's a blonde-headed guy standing there. Uh, I went at him in Lions and Tigers. He threw me all the way across the mat and onto the gym floor. I don't know what the distance was, but it was a long ways. And as Dizzy Dean would say, I slud in uh, off of the mat onto the floor. Uh, you, you meet some marvelous folks. About 10 years after this photograph was taken, maybe not quite that long, maybe eight years, I was assigned to Charlotte, and I came back to uh, put it on me. And I came back to uh, Quantico for an in-service training program. I was a pilot then. It was probably a, a pilot in service. And after dinner one night, I was sitting in the bar at the FBI uh, Academy. Yes, there is a bar there. And I was sitting there, and some friends of mine who were running the uh, SWAT team program at that time saw me and came over to me. And I think one of them may be, have been Danny Colson. He's the little short guy in the back, on the right-hand side in the back row. Uh, 
You see Danny on TV a lot these days talking about stuff as an F FBI expert. But anyway, Danny came over and he said, we've got a SWAT team uh, exercise going on tonight. Got some folks from Seattle, and we would like for you to be the acting SAC in the command center. And he said, they won't know you, and you won't know them. And so I said, okay, I'll do that. Didn't have anything else to do. And so I went to the uh, headquarters uh, command post, and I met uh, the team, and then I dealt with the team leader most of the time. He was a guy about my size. Uh, it had, had an unusual uh, quality, though. His left eye had a huge scar coming down his left eye and back around over his left ear. And uh, I got to uh, working with him, and uh, I could tell that he was a very serious kind of guy. He had been around the horn before. He knew what was going on. And it was my job, though, to be obstructive. And so he would come in, and he would want a green light to take out the hostage taker, and he would tell me how serious it is, and he's afraid the hostage taker is going to kill the hostage, and all of those bad things. And I kept stalling him and kept stalling him and kept stalling him. Did that for probably an hour. And finally, he came in and looked at me uh, out of his one good eye, his right eye, and I thought, I better give this guy a green light or I'm going to be the next victim here. And there's who that was. It's a man named Tommy Norris. The thing you need to look about Tommy is that around his neck, he has the Medal of Honor. He was the only person probably in history to turn down a Medal of Honor. I'll tell you what happened. You may have seen the, the movie or heard of the movie called Bat 21. Uh, Bat 21 was a movie made about a guy named Iseel Hambleton, who was an uh, Air Force colonel who was shot down in Vietnam, and he was a high-value target, or would have been, because he had tremendous experience with tactical weapons and uh, a lot of high-level Air Force experience, and it was very important to get him out. Lots of people lost their lives trying to get uh, Hambleton, Hambleton out, and Tommy Norris, a Navy SEAL, went in with a team, lost uh, several guys on, uh, it was a Vietnamese team, lost several guys on the team, and he and one other guy finally volunteered with him, and they went upriver, and they found uh, Hamilton, who was just about dead, and they brought him out, and then they went back and brought out two other flyers who had been shot down. And for that, the Navy said, we're going to give you, we want to put you in for the Medal of Honor. Tommy said, I don't want it. I didn't, didn't do enough to, to, to earn something like that. A little bit later, just maybe four or five months later, Tommy is engaged in an operation with a Vietnamese uh, SEAL team again, and they encounter a much larger uh, North Vietnamese force. Uh, tremendous firefight ensues. Tommy is shot through the left eye, it exits, uh, back through his skull. He's in the hospital for months and months and uh, recuperating, and they told him, they said, uh, Norris, you're getting the Medal of Honor this time, and you are not going to refuse it. I show you Tommy's picture because he is, while a marvelous young guy, not anymore, he's almost as old as I am, but he's the kind of person that I worked with in the FBI. It almost chokes me up when I think about uh, the people that I had the pleasure of, of, of working with. Uh, it's like the little boy that asked his grandfather if he was a hero, and he says, no, but I worked in the presence of heroes. And Tommy Norris was one of the heroes that I worked with, just one of a few. This is an actual uh, uh, SWAT operation. Uh, this is a briefing. I just put it at the top, listen up, because that's what I would have said. I was a SWAT team leader in Newark for a while. And then they're getting ready to go to work. And he's got a sniper rifle in his hand, and something bad is about to happen. It's a very serious thing, and it's a very serious business. And you've got to be ready all the time. Now, I told you that I chose to come home every night, and that's the reason that I chose to come home every night. That beautiful woman in the back there is my wife, Peggy, who many of you know, and our sons, Aaron and Tom, or Fane and Brent down in front. Uh, 
the boy in the red shirt in the back is now 56, and the one in the front is 52, to show you how long ago that's been. And I'm not going to tell you how old Peggy is, or she would, she would be upset. Uh, after I uh, was in Newark for a while, I had two uh, buddies who had been, uh, one was an Army helicopter pilot, one was a Vietnam, a, a Marine Corps helicopter pilot in Vietnam. And I had done some flying in the Army, and they came up to me one day and they said, we want you to go with us. We're going to do an aerial surveillance. And I said, well, I haven't flown an airplane in 10 years. And they said, we don't want you to fly. We just want you to go with us because you will be able to visualize and you'll be comfortable in the airplane. So I said, okay. So I went with them, and uh, they kind of started talking to me, and they were telling me, we're going to start an FBI flying program. We didn't have any airplanes at that time. And so I said, well, okay, well, what's it, gonna, what's it gonna be like? And we talked back and forth about it. And they were both certified flight instructors and instrument flight instructors. And they said, if you haven't used your GI Bill yet, said you can get all of your ratings back and uh, we'll, we'll uh, give you a lot of instruction on the side. And so I did that and I wound up getting my uh, single and multi-engine and instrument rating and uh, commercial rating and an ATP, all kinds of ratings. and. Uh, became a pilot in command of the FBI. That particular airplane is the first airplane the FBI ever owned. We got it from the Air Force. When we got it, it was green, uh, it was olive drab and day glow orange. It was really something. Uh, it had one bad characteristic though. When you pulled it back to idle, the engine would quit. It happened to me one night going into Teterboro, but fortunately I was able to make the landing. In the background, you see the, uh, World Tr the uh, Statue of Liberty and over behind that is New Jersey. Uh, we flew single engine aircraft over New York City and northern New Jersey, uh, some of the heaviest traffic airspace in the world. Uh, we, uh, we have a pilot's reunion occasionally called Endless Circles because that's all we did was make circles in the sky. But it was extremely dangerous and hazardous. And if we had lost an engine, we had nowhere to go absolutely nowhere. We would have been like uh, Captain Sullenberger putting it in the Hudson River. And the last time we had one of those uh, uh, reunions down in Charleston, uh, to a person, those of us who flew in that uh, circumstance said, we would never do that again. We are too old and too smart now. But back in those days, we were young and full of ourselves, and uh, it was quite exciting. But that's the first airplane that the FBI ever owned. What they use today for surveillance work primarily, it's a Cessna 207, has a FLIR unit, forward-looking airborne infrared radar unit on it, and you have some GIBs, guys in the back, that operate the radar. We also, uh, with the bombing of the cold, uh, needed uh, to get people all over the world because the FBI really became involved in uh, international terrorism at that time. So we had a Gulfstream, and now they have a 737-400. Uh, uh, but they use them for travel all over the world. Uh, this is much later in my career, um, probably the most rewarding time of my career. Um, in 1986, the Department of Justice asked the FBI if we would become involved in investigating what they called at that time toxic waste matters, which was a violation of uh, investigating environmental crimes. Companies who knowingly and willfully disposed of um, hazardous wastes or violated their uh, Clean Water Act permits or clean air permits and lots of other things like that. Nobody was doing that in the FBI. And so I said, I went to my boss and I said, uh, I'd like to do that. Uh, let's see if we have any, uh, I was in North Carolina then, I said, let's see if we can make up some cases or find some cases here in North Carolina. He said, okay, I'll give you six months. And within about six weeks, I had more cases than I could have worked off in six years. But nobody knew how to do anything. And so I had to go to the FBI, uh, to the, excuse me, to the EPA's uh, schools to learn how to take samples, to learn uh, the protocols of uh, how the samples were analyzed uh, to uh, develop chains of custody so we would know that this sample is indeed the sample we took out. 
had some success. I made several cases. And that's when the Department of Justice began to come down and work with me on these cases because they didn't know how to do it either, the environmental crime section. And so I wound up being the FBI's uh, expert kind of in environmental crimes investigations. I taught at the FBI Academy. I taught at the United States Department of Justice. And uh, I traveled all over the country as a troubleshooter um, to offices that had cases that needed the instruction on how to work them. And so uh, that this particular newspaper here uh, on the left, the, the words are not all there, but it says Burleson and FBI on the lookout for environmental crimes in the mountains. And that was a result of a case that I had made up there where we prosecuted a, an electroplater for violating the provisions of the Clean Water Act. And that's what I did, and uh, at the, that's what I was doing at the time of my retirement. And then I started my own environmental consulting business after that. That's an award. Uh, the gentleman on the left is a official with the Department of Justice. The man on the right is my special agent in charge from the Charlotte office. And I was presented with a uh, national award for my work in environmental crime. And that's how I finished my career, taking out the trash. That's my good friend, Mike Hamilton, probably the best forensic photographer that ever picked up a camera. Quite a guy. And we were investigating a huge company in uh, Charlotte, uh, which we subsequently convicted. And the folks got the longest sentence uh, ever imposed in, in an environmental crimes case uh, for violations of the Clean Water Act. I was very, I'm very pleased with my uh, um, work in the environmental crimes field. I think it had some definite impact on uh, what's uh, on, on uh, getting companies to come into compliance with environmental law. Okay, that's enough of the showtime about me and about what FBI agents do. Now we're going to go back and we're going to talk about uh, how cases come together. Where do they come from? What happens when you get a case? How does it get to a court? What happens once it gets to court? And that's what we're going to talk about now. Yesterday, we talked about the uh, Constitution of the United States. And today, we're going to talk about the United States Code. And that's the Code of Laws of the United States of America. It's the official compilation and codification of the general and permanent federal statutes of the United States. As I told you earlier, it contains 15, 53 titles. Title 18 is, deals with criminal acts and procedures and also sets the standards for prosecution and the standards for evidence. Now this next sentence that I'm going to say is extremely important. And it's what most people don't understand. The DOJ and the FBI does not investigate people. By that I mean, we don't start off by saying, for example, we're going to investigate Tom Smith. You don't do that. There is no predicate offense that indicates Tom Smith has done anything. And you cannot just open a case against an individual person. Now, I'm sure Tom Smith is guilty as sin of a lot of things, but not a predicate offense under Title 18 of the United States Code. Investigations are opened as a preliminary investigation based on a complaint that alleges a violation of federal law. Uh, get complaints from a lot of play people. Uh, uh, banks will call in and uh, uh, say that uh, they're missing some money, bank fraud and embezzlement, it's called. Or we can have a bank robbery, which is on the face of it, a violation of the law. And so, but you get these cases in. Some of them are clear cut, like a bank robbery is clear cut. It's a violation of federal law. There's no question about it. Other, other uh, cases are more ticklish, and you have to determine whether a predicate offense has occurred. And a predicate offense is required to open an active investigation. And a predicate offense has to arise, has to be probable cause,